It's great to see this this uh, size crowd. Um, we're I think we've got our technical difficulties, which we've had many today, pretty much ironed out. So we're going to get going here. Um, my name is Kim Brigaman. Um, I'm part of the Bonner what's it called Bonner Milltown History Center, um, and you are in the February of version of our roundtables that we've been having for um, maybe 13 years, 13, 14 years. Um, today's topic uh, is Captain Lewis on the Blackfoot, and I think we've got some fascinating things uh, ahead of you. Before we start, um, I, I want to give you a brief outline of what we're doing here. At any time that you need to get up and go get a beer, or go to the bathroom, whatever. Men's bathroom is around the corner here, and we're going to try our best to keep the, some access to every, everything here um, because there will be other patrons coming in and out of the brewery. Am I close enough? Yeah. The women's bathroom is back around the other corner, which is near where we have coffee and cookies hooked up. Um, and I understand at some point the, the wood-fired pizza truck is going to be in operation. Um, so basically, welcome, welcome to the Kettle House Bonner Tap Room. We're uh, giving this a whirl. Our normal meeting place is at the Catholic Church in Bonner down the street. Um, for reasons that we'll all get into, we're, we've decided to try this here. We, our inaugural event last year was, uh, uh, in this, in the tap room was, um, the subject was the beers, bootlegs, and brewer, bootleggers and breweries of Bonner. So this seemed like a natural location. Um, Captain Lewis on the Blackfoot, um, as, as we'll explain here, is uh, basically right out the back window here. So it seemed like a fitting place. Uh, to, to talk about that. Um, the, we're appreciative of the Kettle House opening up this place. Um, we can, they said, do whatever you needed to do to fit everybody in. Um, it's uh, a little over a year old now. I think it started in December of the year before. And it's, it's been just a great addition to the Bonner community. And um, their, their latest, I guess, is that they're going to be trying to have live music here every Friday. They've already started that. Um, when the weather warms up, they're going to move it out on the patio and have music on the, uh, on the Blackfoot. Briefly, because um, not everybody is, aw is aware of what we do, the Bonner Milltown History Center is located in the post office right down the street in Bonner. And um, we've been putting together these programs, uh, like I say, for, I don't know, 13, 14 years. Every Sunday, or every third Sunday of January, February, and March, usually. And um, this year we are going to, because we are of an aging population at the center, which Actually, everybody's of an aging population, but um, 
We are we're we're wanting to expand our hours. Right now, the history center is open on Tuesday mornings and Wednesdays and Thursdays afternoons. As uh, we get closer to summer, we're we're looking at expanding our hours and also looking for volunteers who might be interested in helping us with these programs and manning the history center. So as summer comes, we'll probably at least be open on Saturdays as well. So anybody that's interested in volunteering, um, I think there's a sign-up sheet in the back, or talk to us. Uh, we'll have more details next, next month at the roundtable next month. So that's an invitation to volunteer. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up briefly is um, we are uh, partnering with the Historical Museum of Fort Missoula in their efforts to restore locomotive number seven, which sat out here um, in the in Bonner Park, starred in the movie Timberjack in 1954-55, and uh, they're they've undertaken a huge um, effort at, in at the Fort Missoula Museum to restore it and actually perhaps to get it running again. And so um, we are trying to help them with that. And doing that, we're planning on a showing of Timberjack here, well, in Bonner, probably at the school, in this spring. We did this five years ago on the 50th anniversary and uh, had, I don't know, a gym, a gym full of people that showed up to watch the old movie. And so, and you still can't get that theme song out of your head. Um, so we've got that coming up. It probably won't be until May, but keep an eye on that and we'll, we'll give you further details of that uh, in the coming months uh, and at next, next month's round table. Beyond that, the, the museum is planning um, showings of Timberjack in town, and I, I don't know the details of that yet, but these are all fundraisers to get this locomotive back in, the, back in action. Um, the man that's really spurred this effort for locomotive number seven, Larry Ingold, is, um, has accepted or we're, we're inviting him to do a special one of these round tables in, but in the fall. And so instead of the winter round table, we'll have a fall round table. And again, details are pending on that. Um, one other, two other things, and we'll get going here. Um, in the back, Milt Clark has a newly devised or developed or produced map of the all-time railroad map of Montana, 1880 to 2019. If you, if he's got it on display back there. If you get a chance to take a look at it, he's selling them for only $5, and uh, they're the best maps that I've seen of the entire uh, railroad network of Montana. Last, lo the last pitch here, and then I'll, we'll, I'll sh shut up and sit down. The... Um, team that's, how many of here have played baseball on Kelly Pine Field in Bonner? How many have memories of that? We, we're, it's still in action. This was a, a ball field that was, the grandstands were built in 1937. It's named after a, a ball player there, um, Kelly Pine, who um, was a, a worker at the mill, but played with only one hand. And he was a, an outstanding player. And when he was killed in a car wreck in 1935, they built the grandstands and, and uh, re, uh, they named it after Kelly Pine. We've just uncovered some unknown photos of Kelly, Kelly Pine in, in his ball playing days. And they are now at the, uh, at the History Center, if anybody wants to drop in. Um, I mention this in part because there is an effort for the team that's playing there now that uses Kelly Pine. Um, the school, Bonner School, is the owner of the field, and they 
are looking for donations, I guess, to um, to maintain the field. The school wants them to restain the grandstands, and uh, they want to work on access issues um, that so they they're allowed to host tournaments. But it's it's the um, Missoula Aces 13U, 14U baseball team. So those guys are getting their Kelly Pine memories like a lot of us have today. Is is Willie in the crowd? Bef before I bring on our star, Dan Hall, <laughs> I wanted to... Uh, Will, I talked to Willie Bateman, and he was going to try to make it. Willie just turned 91, I believe. And uh, the weather kind of dictates whether he's going to make it or not. But he has, our theme today is basically Captain Lewis on the Blackfoot, but really the road to the buffalo on the Blackfoot that Captain Lewis saw, or that he followed on July 4th of 1806. Dan Hall will be getting into more of that, but the question always has been, in my mind and a lot of others, I think, where that road to the buffalo that Captain Lewis followed went here with all these cliff faces. And um, I've tried to Google map it, and I, I can't figure out why it wouldn't be a, uh, it, would, it wouldn't be, or where, where it could have gone because it was on the other side of the river. Um, and Willie told me the story that he, he, tra he actually found a trail that went over these cliffs over here when he was in high school in 1948. He had had his Lewis and Clark journals in hand, and he got to curious about it. And uh, his story was, and I wish he was here to tell it because he tells it better than I do. There's a, at the far end of West Riverside, this, just down river here, there's what locals call Cowboy Trail. And Willie, back in 1948, walked a ways up Cowboy Trail, and then he found a road that has probably been since been uh, covered over logging operations and fire operations that, act that went, as I understand it, went up over this cliff and came down, he said, right at the end of the, um, where the railroad trestle used to cut across the Blackfoot, which is right, right out our window here. And so it looks to me like the road that Meriwether Lewis followed through Bonner would have been coming, coming down this draw. And it must, there's a big fa cliff face across from the uh, way station uh, uh, fishing access, it must have, there must have been room for the road to the buffalo that the, that the native tribes followed for millennia um, to, to squeeze past that cliff face here. But they were up and, up and above here. With that, I'll get somebody up here who knows what he's talking about. Dan Hall has been... Involve, involved with, um, I've got to read my notes here. He's been in, involved with historic preservation and the study of Western history and prehistory for almost 25 years. He's the author of numerous reports on the history and prehistory of the Rocky Mountain West, the Columbia Plateau, and the Great Plains. He has supervised and conducted cultural resource surveys across an eight state region. He's uh, Dan is the lead archaeologist, uh, I think co-founder or founder of Western Cultural, and um, and his his knowledge of the Lewis and Clark story in Western Montana is based, unlike a lot of ours, on science, and I think that'll be the I, I think you'll find his talk fascinating. Dan is to me one of the more interesting guys I know. He should do a beer commercial sometime. <laughs> He's also a Cubs fan if you want to give him a hard time about that. So with that I'll, I'll get out of here and Dan you you got the floor. 
Oh, I should say that there will be a break time after Dan's presentation, roughly around 3 o'clock. You bet. And, um, and we will have uh, another presentation after that, a short presentation by Norm Jacobson, who has traced the trail basically from, um, I'm going to say East Missoula, up to Clearwater Junction with a slide presentation. So, Dan? Thanks, Kim. Uh, it's nice to see a big crowd here today. I wasn't quite expecting this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I spent eight years down the Lolo uh, working on Traveler's Rest. Uh, you may have heard me or seen me down there at some point in time. Um, as a result of that, I've had the opportunity to work and study many places along the trail. Um, and this, this opportunity came up in Alice Creek, and of course I jumped on it immediately. Uh, this, what we call the Black... Is it because this is pointing the wrong direction? Can we turn it up a little bit? Is that better? All right. So it's just like eating a hamburger, right? That's what we're doing? Okay. <coughs> what, what we call the Blackfoot River, the Native Americans have a different name for it. And it depends upon what tribe you're talking to. But th this trail, this road that goes along the Blackfoot um, is quite old. It is quite ancient. And if you want to put it into a context, um, think about the trails that converge on Traveler's Rest. There, there's a trail that goes to the south, the Nimi Poo, that connects to southern Idaho and the, the Basin and Range country of, of Utah. There's uh, the Lolo Trail, heads out to the west, uh, to the Columbia River and to the coast. There are trails that connect to the north and to Canada. And then we've got this trail that connects out into uh, Great Falls and, and the plains. So this is a really large swath of the, the North American continent. And the Native Americans knew this. Their, their command of the geography of the Pacific Northwest was pretty astounding. In the our study focused on the Alice Creek area, if you've ever been up there, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, we start with the, the, the prehistory of the area, uh, which is extensive. There are prehistoric sites along the trail that are in excess of four or 5,000 years old. Uh, there are things at the top of the pass that are associated with the Jesuit experience in Montana, which is really kind of unusual if you think about it. Uh, the Forest Service was in Alice Creek early. And then, of course, there's mining and settlement and everything else that occurred in Lincoln. See if I can figure out what we're doing here. If you've not been to the top of the pass before, I would highly recommend that you do so. Um, you can, there's a, a trailhead here, and you can hike up to the top of the pass. And when you're on the top of the pass, you have a really commanding view of, of the plains. Um, you can see the Sun River. You can see uh, Square Butte. You see Great Falls. Um, it really, truly is an amazing hike. Lewis and Clark Pass up uh, Kadot, Kadot Creek. You'll, you'll see it. I'll show you a map here in just a minute. <coughs> there are visible trail tread that you can see in Alice Creek. That you can see in Landers Fork. Um, there are rock cairns that are marking the trail. There are trees that have been peeled. Um, the Native Americans were peeling the bark off to get to the sugars that were underneath. Um, and all of these are concentrated in the Alice Creek drainage, uh, which is truly amazing for a Native American trail in western Montana. And when we talk about culturally scarred trees, the, the Native Americans would take a tool and they would cut right along the base. And then they would pull that bark up, and it would leave a very distinct scar. <coughs> So we began our study looking at 
what the Forest Service had been doing for, for years. That for decades, they have been, an archaeologist have been working up there. Um, in addition to the archaeologists have been working up there, um, they had contracted with the Confederate States and Kootenai Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And so they had generated a tremendous amount of data. Um, they had sites, they had trail tread, um, they had all this. All we, well, our job was to come in and synthesize this. One of the first things that we wanted to look, what are the early maps showing us and how does that compare to what's on the ground? The trail tread, the, the prehistoric sites, um, the culturally scarred trees. And what we've got here, this is the map that Clark prepared, obviously after he and Lewis had re reunited. And this is just a small piece of the map. And we're, we're coming up to Blackfoot here. There's uh, Cottonwood, Monitor Creek, uh, the North Fork, and into the Lincoln Valley. But what we're seeing here is at, <coughs> excuse me, um, where Landers Fork hits, we're coming off of the river, crossing a small divide, and then into Alice Creek and up to the pass. This map may look familiar to some of you. Uh, this is a piece of the map that was prepared for um, Mullen's investigation into Montana. And uh, again, what the cartographer has done is map in the Native American Trail, or the Indian Trail. And these are uh, different names for it. But again, we're leaving Landers Fork, coming, crossing the small divide into the Alice Creek drainage, and then up on, on the Lewis and Clark Pass. No, it is not. But what, what these maps are showing us is there's a strong correlation between what the early cartographers are showing for the, the location of the trail and what's on the ground. And, and that's really important because that helps bolster the argument. And this, I, to me, this is one of my favorite places along the trail. Um, the, the, the captains were so geographically descriptive in, in their journals. And, and every time I drive through the Ovando Valley, it is the Prairie of Knobs. And so we, we began our investigation looking in the entire Blackfoot Valley, in Lincoln area, in the Landers Fork, and then on up into to Alice Creek. And there, like I say, there, there are the trail tread, the culturally scarred trees, the prehistoric campsites. Um, it, it's an amazing concentration of resources. And then once you're up on the top of the pass, um, again, I, I highly recommend the hike. Um, it is truly, truly an amazing thing to see. My first experience on Lewis and Clark Pass would have been elk hunting in 1981. Um, I've, I've been a big fan of Lewis and Clark Pass ever since. And so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the, what we see on the ground. And again, so here we have, in, in the Lincoln Valley, we have trail tread. We have rock cairns. We have prehistoric campsites. Up, up at the top of the pass, you can see travel marks in, in the soil, um, which is, again, we don't see this concentration of, of all these resources in a small, confined space like this. One of the questions that we have as archaeologists is, how old? Who built these things? What were they built for? Um, rock cairns, stone features, all of these things. Are, are problematic because we don't know when they were built. We don't know who built them. Um, we have an idea what they were for, obviously the trail markers. <coughs> but other than that, um, archaeologists have been struggling with rock, rock cairns and stone features for generations. Um, years ago, geologists began asking the question, can we use plant life to date earthquakes and glaciers? And as it turns out, plant life can date these things. And as it turns out, 
the lichen is the plant that, that, that's of interest because it can be used to date the, these geological events. <laughs> so at archaeologists, we, we steal techniques from, from anybody and everybody. Um, and so we began to ask the question, can we use lichen dating to date these stone features? And there were archaeologists in California that pioneered this. Um, archaeologists in Wyoming have used this technique. Um, it had not been tried in Montana before. <coughs> so what we did, we started with the Lincoln Cemetery. And we went and found Minnie Neal, and she had died in 1869. And we went to her grave, and we were able to find specific genus of lichens. There are roughly 600 species of, of lichens that are known to man. There are a dozen that we can calibrate growth rate for. So we know when many passed away. We can go in there and we have to identify genus species of the lichens, but we're able to do that. And then we're able to establish a growth rate. There are three lichens that we're able to positively identify. Um, I had to bring a botanist with me. Um, it's an incredibly complex process to identify lichens down to genus species. Um, you have to have um, a microscope, different chemical solutions. Um, there's a whole series of tests that you have to do, but you have to get it down to genus species. And these are the three that we were able to identify uh, in, in the cemetery, and then we were off we went through the Blackfoot to try and uh, identify these stone features. Now, the, the current thought is, as people pass along on the trail, they'll add a stone, maybe two stones, to mark their, their passing as they, they've gone through. Um, and again, it's kind of really hard to say, but there are... Uh, I've no idea, off the top of my head, I can't recall exactly how many there are here in the upper Blackfoot Valley. Um, we did the lichen study on, on all of uh, whatever we could find, and some really interesting dates kicked out. And so now for the first time, we're able to put these stone features into a framework. Um, if we think <coughs> how these cairns are constructed, a stone at a time, all we're doing is just dating the top. The, the, the stones that are at the bottom are considerably older. And so when you see that date of 1767, 1743, that's just the lichens that are growing on the top, and that doesn't tell us how old the bottom is. But still, at least for the first time, now we're talking about who built these. At the top of the pass, there are these stone circles. Um, the tribal elders inform us um, this is what they call Indian Fort Pass. And, and the sailors would come and they would stop at the, the bottom of the pass and they would hike up to the, the top and you can see forever in a day and if they saw anybody they didn't want to meet they would come back down and wait. And then the next day they would come back up get into these stone features and look, sit and look and wait. And then as soon as the path was clear, off to the buffalo grounds, they would go. And so we did a lichen study on the stone forts. And these kicked out 650-some years ago. Uh, the botanist that I had with me is telling me um, there had been a fire up here, and it had killed all the, the plant life. And so he did some tree ring dating, um, looked at other tree ring studies that the Forest Service had, and there was a fire up there 640, 650 years ago. Um, I have every reason to believe that these are significantly older than that date that we're seeing. Uh, but this is, there's some really eye-popping things that are up there. and to the Jesuit experience. I had seen this Celtic cross 
20, 25 years ago, and I had no idea what I was looking at. Um, Sarah Scott was the Helena National Forest archaeologist who made the connection. Um, and I think she really did some truly outstanding sleuthing there to figure this out. Uh, Father Point was in Stevensville at the mission. And in 1842, he wrote in his journals about coming west, or excuse me, going east with the sailors to go hunt buffalo. And he wrote in his journals that when he was at the top of the pass, he constructed a cross and celebrated Mass. Now, we don't know exactly what he built. And so we did the, the lichen analysis. We found the, the, the proper specimens we were looking for. Um, the dates kick out at 1847, plus or minus 10 years. Um, so I think Sarah Scott's interpretation of what, what has been found up there is probably spot on. And again, the Forest Service had been in Alice Creek for quite some time. Um, obviously on horseback, heading in what is now the Bob. Um, riding horses on the trails that we see. They obviously constructed some of these stone cairns we're looking at. They, did, they blazed the trees. But if you think back to that picture, the blazes were completely different than what the, the Native Americans were doing. So again, for the first time, <coughs> Now we're able to put this into context. We're able to separate out that, that Euro-American experience from the Native American experience. And that, that really helps tell the story of what we're seeing you know, along the trail. All right, so now I want to uh, back up a little bit and talk about why Lewis and his nine men and the 17 ponies came through here in 1806. And the, the story backs up to Thomas Jefferson and Galton and Dearborn and the conversations they had in Jefferson's library. Um, they talked about the geography of the West. They talked about the presence of the British. Um, the British, they had been into the Columbia River. Um, they're, they're building fur trade posts in the McKinsey River. Um, the presence of the British in the Pacific Northwest uh, is, is weighing heavily on Thomas Jefferson. So as the, as the, the Corps of Discovery is coming upstream, they get to the Marias River. They can't figure out which is which. Um, they stop, reconnoiter for a few days. They figure it out, and they continue on. Uh, to Three Forks, and the Travelers Rest, and Vinci out to the coast. Um, it is that Fort Classic winter where, where the captains start to assimilate all the knowledge that they acquired, what they learned from the Indians, and what they recorded themselves. And they, they produced a map. Uh, John Bogan Allen is a cartographer and a historian, he's one of my favorites. Um, and he tells us that. This map that the captains produced that winter is the single greatest contribution uh, from the expedition because for the first time, the two coasts of the North American continent are tied together. This had never been done before. So the captains then, they're faced with the task getting home. They still have to dis figure out the most direct and practical route. Those are the instructions from uh, Jefferson. But the other thing is the British. And I was fortunate in my, my studies. I, I was able to spend a lot of time with Stephen Ambrose. And he was very generous with his time. Um, he never laughed at my silly questions. Um, and we talked about this decision to part company at Traveler's Rest. And if you read Undaunted Courage, you'll see Ambrose is he's the biggest rah-rah cheerleader for the expedition you'll ever meet. Um, but here he's quite critical. The captains have split their military command. And this is something you don't do in the field. And Ambrose kept hammering on this point repeatedly over and over again. You don't do this. Don't do this. But there has to be an overriding reason why they split. 
So obviously the exploration of the Yellowstone is important, but the Marias, we have to return to the Marias. And it, if you think about what they had thought about in that Fort Clatsop winter, the, the, the Marias and the Great Falls of the Missouri are essentially the same size river. That's what they encountered anyway. And so it logically felt that the river basin from the Marias to the headwaters would be the same size as the Marias. The Louisiana Purchase included those tributaries on the north side of the Missouri River. So this is the check on the, the British that Thomas Jefferson was looking for. <coughs> and so they part at Traveler's Rest. Um, Lewis and his men come through here. Um, as Kim says, right, right down the, the hill here, um, up the Blackfoot, on up over the Continental Divide. Um, they get to the Marias, and for two days, they're socked in by weather. They can't take any celestial observations. They can't put their location on a map. Um, eventually, they figure out they're nowhere near 50th parallel. Um, and so they, they're pressed for time. They know that they have a complicated uh, reunion party that's going to occur at various points along the river. And so they leave. But, and, and Ambrose is real clear on this, camp disappointment. And that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the Marias River. The milk? This one here? That's the mussel shell. Some of you may have seen this map before. This is uh, another inset of the previous map I showed you up on the pass uh, from Mullins' expedition. And uh, just to kind of orient you, now we're talking about the, the trail here in, in Bonner coming through the canyon. Um, we're here, there's uh, Traveler's Rest, Missoula, the confluence of the Better and the Clark Fork, um, the Clark Fork River, the Blackfoot, and the Indian Trail. Unfortunately, at this scale, all we know from this early map is that it's on the north side of the river. Uh, we don't know, really, we can't say anything more than that. Uh, Martin Plamondon is one of my favorite cartographers. Um, you, you may have seen his work. Um, and what Plamondon did, Plamondon did was um, there are geographic tidbits that are in the journals um, where they describe the country that they're passing through and he'll drop them onto the map. So for here, for example, right at the confluence of the Blackfoot and the Clark Fork, uh, he talks about a handsome plain that they traveled through. The other thing that Plamondon has done that really helps us is these symbols that he's dropped everywhere. And these are the courses and distances that the captains recorded as they're traveling along. And so we know they were here, and they recorded a distance and, and bearing. They were here, and they recorded one. They tell us the road is on the north side of the river. Uh, back to Stephen Ambrose, he's, he was quite colorful. Um, his description of, of the road from here up to Lincoln was that it was a well-marked and easily identifiable trail. In fact, it was so well-marked that even a white man could find it. And I, I've looked at the journals and I have no idea where he came up with that, but um, that's Stephen Ambrose. Um, <clears throat> so in, in closing, when we were working in Lincoln on the trail, um, everyone had told us that we needed to stop and see this gentleman that worked for the Montana Department of Transportation. Um, they said he knows the Lincoln Valley. He knows the roads. He knows the trails. He's been out there. He was born here in Lincoln. <coughs> and so we knocked on the door and introduced ourselves. Um, turns out he actually was retiring. And the next day he was leaving for Great Falls. 
um, he took us out and showed us a trail. Showed us trail tread, showed us all these features, um, and he knew it. Um, he'd lived it, he'd found it, he'd walked it. Um, and the purpose of sharing this is to what Kim was saying earlier. There are people here in this community that know it. They've walked it. They know where the trail is. Um, I'm by no means the expert here in Bonner, but there are people here in the community who are, and we need to find them and get their stories. Are there any questions? I'm one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Ken Piers. I, I live at the end of Zog Drive and Arne Zog on all the land up against the mountain all the way to, pretty much to Mount Jumbo at one time. And uh, he delivered milk to us, so I'm one of the few people that probably remember, still remembers him, but he would talk with my dad for hours. And he would tell about the uh, the Indians coming through, and and they would actually set up their camp right where my house is today. There's a patch of trees there, and that's where the Indians like to camp. I'm sure after a long trip coming over the mountains. And to get back to what Willie had told us earlier, or he had left with. Ken, there's a trail that went up the mountain, which was Cowboy Trail, and it goes back into Cowboy Creek, and if you go back almost to the, where it goes, gets the steepest part, you go, you can pretty much come flat across the top here, and you'll come right down to here. So it's, it's really the most logical place that they could possibly cross that mountain, because this was sheer rock here. There's no way they could get around it. So I've walked all of that through my entire life, so it's quite familiar to me where I've lived here so long. So that's kind of my story. Do I really need one? i got a big voice. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Castudia, and I'm the manager of Milltown State Park for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. You know, everything you're looking out across the river here is part of Milltown State Park today. Several years back, I had a AmeriCorps member doing some research on the Buffalo Road and Lewis and everything, and Lewis was quite the botanist as well. And uh, he collected, for at least Euro-Americans, the first specimen of monkey flowers. If you know monkey flowers, they're a yellow flower that grows in a, a seed. And uh, there was, wasn't in the journals, but there was some documentation that it was from somewhere just above the confluence of the Clark Fork, which was the East Fork, I think, in those days, but uh, above the Clark Fork and the Blackfoot. And uh, this was in July, and he told me that, and I'm like, I bet I know where that is. And if you look directly across the river where that draw comes down, there's a seep there that is full of monkey flowers in July. And so I would guess, you know, you can't definitively say that that's the spot, but boy, it sure seems like a possibility. Traveling Mike, who wants to comment or question? You had a girl, Dan, on something here. Is there more to the talk, or is this question time? This is question and answer time. We'll, we'll follow this with a brief break, and then Norm Jacobson will um, come on. Dan, I, I think it would help the group to clarify. You said they're trying to check the British in Canada, and at Camp Disappointment, they were disappointed. But you need to go a little further and say why, why they were disappointed. What, what was the, the disappointment? The, the Marius was not. The, the Marias was not the answer. Um, when when they encountered the Marias and, and the Great Falls, or the excuse me, the Missouri, the two streams were identical in size, and and this really confused them, threw them for a loop. They spent several days reconnoitering, trying to f answer this question. And so, as the previous image had shown, when you think about the geographical extent, it took them 53 days to go from the Marias um, into the Bitterroot River. Um, 
this that's a really large river basin. So to them, during the class up winter, it made sense that the river basin from the Marias would be equally as large and would extend north, further north than anybody had previously known. It would go beyond the, the settled 50th parallel. And so this was going to be the answer to check to keep the British out. And again, <coughs> the mouth of the Columbia is known. The British have sailed up it. They're producing charts of, of the, the bathymetry of the, the sound. Um, they're exploring it. Hudson's Bay Company is coming down. Uh, they're in the McKinsey River. Um, they've been in Montana. Uh, this is something that Thomas Jefferson and Gallatin and Dearborn talked about extensively. How do we keep the British out of the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, and go one step further. So they're, they're hoping the Marias will go much further into Canada since the Louisiana Purchase includes everything that drains into Missouri. If the Marias, if the Marias goes a lot further into Canada, they can claim that the southern part of Canada is part of the United States. And Lewis can tell from Camp Disappointment that the Marias goes towards Glacier Park and no further up, and he's extremely disappointed. <laughs> and, and so the United States northern border is not going to go to the 50th parallel or the 51st or 2nd. It's going to stay much further south than they hoped for. I have a question. Um, one of the quests of Lewis and Clark was the Northwest Passage. And we have a lot of people who have studied this. And why wouldn't the Marias end up being considered the Northwest Passage since it's a fairly easy uh, drop down into the Flathead Basin? Um, in, in order to address that question, you have to go back to the, the concept of the Northwest Passage. And ever since your Americans arrived on the North American continent, they were looking for a way to get across, get around. It, it, there was no business here. They wanted to get to the Orient. That's what drove the search for the Northwest Passage. If you think the Mandan village is known, it's plotted onto maps. Um, it's a lot long, is, is almost similar. It's within a couple of degrees of the mouth of the Columbia. And so the, the prevailing wisdom of some of the leading intellectuals on the eastern seaboard is you have these two mighty rivers that are essentially the same position, and you could just follow them upstream. And then when you get to the headwaters, you're going to have a small height of land that you cross. And then you get into a canoe and you head downstream. And this is going to be the most practical route across the North American continent. But it turns out Montana geography is a little more complex than that. Kim? A few years ago, we took a paddle or a boat trip down. Hold it down. A few years ago, we took a, a canoe trip down the Missouri, and we went to where the Marias and, and the Missouri come together, and our guide took us up onto this bluff that sits right there overlooking the confluence of those two rivers, and uh, we like to think that's where the Lewis and Clark stood many years before, and he explained it that even though at the time of the year we were there, which was later in the summer, the river flows were down, the volumes were down, and there was a very distinct difference between the volume in the Missouri versus the Marias. But when Lewis and Clark came up there, I believe they were coming, as our guide explained, they were coming through in the spring of the year when the flooding was heavy, and so there was so much flooding, so much water, that they couldn't dis easily discern the sizes of the rivers until they progress way up them. My two cents worth. No, that, that, that's correct. There had been a, a freak flood rainstorm uh, in the headwaters of the Marais in the swift current um, area. And, and so that flash flood is what made that huge 
flow of water coming down the Marias and what confused them. Um, and it was just that one of those, we, we've all seen them here in Montana. Um, <laughs> Bannock got one a couple of years ago. Um, I've been to that place where you're talking about. Um, I'm convinced there's an archaeological site there. And if you think about the journals, when they were there, they dug up the cache they had left. But it had gotten wet. And so they took all that stuff and they just put it back in the hole in the ground and left. And so for years I've been thinking, how cool would that be? <laughs> I bet you we could find that. I'll go. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to add an interesting comment about Lewis and Clark Pass. Um, the Mandan Indians in the Hadatsa actually told the expedition of Lewis and Clark that that pass existed. Um, and it would be the quickest way to get through the Rockies and the Traveler's Rest. And in fact, when Lewis comes through here, it takes him five, six days at the most to get back to Great Falls. It took over 50 days to go from Great Falls to Helena, to Three Forks, to Dillon, into the Bitterroot. So it, it was a nice shortcut. One of the problems was the Shoshone and the horses were much further to the south, and the expedition needed horses. They had Sacagawea with them, and they thought she could be helpful in getting those ho horses, and they ended up getting a guide, Toby. So if they had gone over Lewis and Clark Pass from Great Falls, they probably wouldn't have found horses until they got in the Hi Idaho with the Nez Perce, and that could have ended the expedition. So it was good that they didn't go through the pass going west. And it was a major. It was definitely a shortcut that Lewis wanted to check out on the way back. There, there, there are two points there that you raised that are really good points. The first one is the horse and how important that was to the expedition and being able to make the, the train in the country that, that they did. And the second point you hit on is one that I've, I've touched on everywhere I go, and that's the Native American knowledge. Um, to them, this is not discovery. They, they, they know this. Um, this, is, this is their country. They've known it for millennia. Um, as I talked earlier about, when you think about those trails that, that, and what they connect, um, they know this. To the society and culture that existed on the eastern seaboard, this is discovery. Uh, they are the core of discovery. To the people who are here, it's not. Um, the, the knowledge that the, the Native Americans have is way, way more extensive than what the leading in intellectuals on the eastern seaboard had. I have a question about the lichen work. Um, does the amount of moisture in the air or aridity influence the dates? And also, what about subsequent fires, not the one from long ago, but the series of fires that would have affected them through the years? Does that change the dates at all? No. Um, that, that's a really good question. There are a host of environmental factors that control how or the, the, the growth rate of, of lichens and exposure to wind, exposure to sun, um, snow cover, uh, moisture is one. Um, and that's why we, we gathered the data at the Lincoln Cemetery. If we had come to, say, uh, Miles City and, and collected data, that data would not transpose up to Lincoln Valley. And that that's the reason why we had to have it so close to the source. Uh, and that is one of the limiting factors of the lichen analysis. The top of the pass is a lot more area than down in Lincoln. It is, but the, the, when you're talking about an organism that's growing a millimeter per 20 years, 30 years, um, the, the, the effect that that has is, is not really that large. But, and that's not true for all species. And this is the problem that you have, why you have to get genus species in your identification, why that's so important. Because there are some lichens that, that where moisture does affect growth more than others. But these three that we found, it, it wasn't a limiting factor. Can you study any bright lichens? Uh, it, it, Yes, uh, but to, and again, I'm, I'm not a botanist. Um, I just steal their work. Um, my understanding is that the, the, the orange lichens that we see here in western Montana, 
does not have an established growth rate. There are too many environmental factors that influence how fast or how slow it grows, and so we can't use that as a, a dating tool. And, and again, there's 600 species in, in, in the known species in the world, and there's only 10 or 12 that we can we can use as a tool. It, um, we're lucky we have that. I'd just like to point out that there's another explorer that is a lot of fun to read about in a book called Sources of the River, and that's David Thompson, who did it up in Canada. And, you know, Lewis and Clark, we think, did an amazing job. They did, but it took them three years, four years, and uh, they made one trip and lost one man. David Thompson went back and forth across this continent, I don't know how many times, but at least four and never lost a man. Oh, he came close once, <laughs> very close. But anyway, it's a fascinating book, Sources of the River, and there are several others. Uh, I found that just as fascinating as reading about Lewis and Clark. I think they're both just incredible. I, I, to, to expand on that a little bit, um, I would mentioned John Logan Allen earlier, who's a cartographer turned historian, or a geographer turned historian, and his, his book, Passes Through the Garden, is, is a fascinating read, and he talks about what, what you had just spoken of, and the, the history of, really, the, the Euro-American experience on the North American continent is exploration. Um, it's the journey, whether it's the, the, the Spanish conquistadors coming north, whether it's Lewis and Clark, whether it's Thompson. Um, the, the, what Logan is talking about in the Passes Through the Garden is that, that journey, and that journey is the shared American experience. And, and you're absolutely right. Thompson is an amazing character. Anybody else? I, I would like to make the point, uh, we can't stress enough, that the route that Captain Lewis was following on that one day in 1806, the 4th of July of 1806, was basically a superhighway for thousands and thousands, well, hundreds and hundreds at least years, Sally, you probably know better than I do, <laughs> um, of, of the natives, and not just one tribe, but many tribes, and it was only one road to the buffalo from the west of the mountains to the east. And so um, he benefited, basically, he, he didn't have to find his way. It was a well-marked path. It was... Um, the Nez Perce guides that, he, that left him down at, at uh, Grant Creek that day, that morning, were not willing to, to go up here because they thought that they would be attacked by the Pawkees. But they knew what, what was coming to, to Captain Lewis. And uh, so the fact that there was no incidents, at least until they got up to the, to the, to the two medicine, um, was pure luck, I think. Maybe you guys would agree with that. So We're going to take a, um, a short break, bathroom, beer, whatever, and um, in about 10 minutes, then we'll resume with, with Norm Jacobson's question, uh, present, presentation. So thank you, Dan. We're still working on the projector. I have supreme confidence that it's going to come through. It's the same one we just used. Um, near the back of the brewery, we've got this, um, the book on Powell Swanser, who's a local artist. Um, has written a book about his relative John Coulter who was on the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition of course John Coulter um, 
Powell is a relative, a distant relative of Mr. Coulter, and so he has written John Coulter, Young Patriot, um, probably 2015, 2016 is when it came out, I think somewhere in that area, and um, they, are, they are on sale back there. Um, there's uh, a lot of good historic uh, material in here. I've read most of it, at least part of it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, it's, it might be a worthwhile thing to look up. Again, John Coulter, Young Patriot. Um, without stealing some of Norm's thunder... <laughs> There's not much thunder today. Actually, it's a lot better than I thought it would be outside, too. Um, the, the route, um, the early route that Meriwether Lewis and his nine men took uh, after they left what, was, what became Hellgate Trading Post out, out west of town is where they camped on the night of July 3rd and 4th. The route they took went through Missoula, basically. Um, there's some disagreement whether it followed um, Front Street, but um, it stayed then on the north side of the Blackfoot for the, rest of the, for the rest of its route, essentially. And so where you see um, you know, up the Blackfoot, the, the old big Blackfoot Railroad, that's roughly the the road to the Buffalo, all the way up um, to, to Ovando, essentially. And um, so some of the geographic points that may come up that maybe not everybody is aware of, we, beyond Cowboy Trail, which is up over here, the first drainage up is Johnson Creek, and then we go on up to Twin Creek, which um, Lewis, in Lewis's journals, he mentions both creeks um, that are so close together there by at Twin Creek. On up, it did not cross over to go through the Potomac Valley. It followed on on the north side around into Nine Mile Prairie, um, across um, past past Ovando. It didn't go as far as Ovando. It did not stop at Trixie's, which is. <laughs> I guess Jim Havick is gone. Um, and, and on up then, um, essentially along Highway 200 to Lincoln, although and Norm will be able to tell us more of this, and, and a couple other people that I know have studied it, and uh, it, it did leave the valley to get over the mountains and then come down into Lincoln, the Lincoln Valley. Um, and I'm saying that like I know what I'm talking about, but I, that was that's my understanding, and I'm sure there's a people here that have a better understanding about it than I do. But just uh, some of the geographic points that may come up in Norm's. Norm is a photographer, and he has documented a lot of history, not just on the Lewis and Clark uh, trail, but. Um, he's he, he's taken me on trips to show where David Thompson, for instance, came in the Mission Valley and uh, dropped into the Missoula Valley for one February day. Um, and there's some discussion among people who are here, in fact, who about where David Thompson in 1812 um, observed the Missoula Valley just six years after Meriwether Lewis had been there. Um, so, <laughs> I'm trying to think of... I need someone that knows something about a computer. <laughs> yeah. Do we have anybody young enough that knows about computers? We have been technologically bedeviled all day. We didn't have power to hook up the sound equipment and, and the video equipment until too close to showtime. Uh, oh, 
This is a better storyteller than I. <laughs> Sally Thompson. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Shishiqua? Okay, so the trail fanatics, raise their hands. So when, when uh, Lewis got past the top of Lewis and Clark Pass, then he has these very clear, specific directions that he must have gotten from the Nez Perce who were going to come with him, telling him how many creeks he was going to cross before he saw Shishiqua. So I'm not going to tell you anymore. <laughs> okay, so who, who is going to guess if you cross seven small creeks on the other side of Lewis and Clark Pass, what feature of the landscape is going to catch your eye enough that you're going to go, there it is. No, good good guesses. No, it's going to be to the north, right along close to the front. Haystack. Haystack. And, and the word shishikwa, does anyone know what it means? It means rattle in Old French. And the Blackfeet call it the Rattle Hills. And people have always thought that was because of rattlesnakes around that area, but it's because that's where they collected their small stones for the Rattles for the Crazy Dog Society. Haystack hey, hey, being right out of Augusta. Right between the mountains and Augusta. Yeah. I think it's showtime. Norman Jacobson is a uh, retired educator and has been for years, many of you know him, as a volunteer and a guide at the Traveler's Rest out of Lolo. Uh, Lewis and Clark aficionado like a lot of us, and uh, he's done a lot of documenting on, on the Lewis and Clark Trail. And uh, do you want to do it from here, Norm? Okay. <coughs> The, I have uh, taken a number of slides, but I've also used some slides in, uh, uh, from others. So, uh, and this is one of them. This is one of the first uh, sketches of the. Oh, okay, well, is one of the the first sketches of Traveler's Rest, and let's see. Traveler's Rest sits right about in that area. This was sketched by uh, Gustav Sohan. Uh, this is a picture of Traveler's Rest right at the, uh, yeah, more or less at the moment. This is where we are now. This is all uh, yeah, asphalted, and the, the bridge right here goes here. The thing that uh, <laughs> proved that this was the place that Lewis and Clark stayed was right here because that's where the latrine is located. <laughs> and uh, a couple of the uh, men had uh, contacted the venereal disease, and they were treating it with mercury. <laughs> and, and so they found mercury uh, at that latrine right in that area. Okay, uh, they didn't get out, uh, started early, very early, so what they did, or what we think they did, is went up over Hayes Creek, and Hayes Creek is right here, uh, and goes out onto the flat. Uh, then they came down, and uh, this is the, uh, the bitter root here, the Clark Fork coming in here, and they didn't want to cross uh, the Bitterroot without, they'd have to cross the, whoop, uh, cross the uh, Clark Fork too, so they went down, uh, they went down past the confluence and crossed right about in somewhere in that area there. And the interesting thing about it, uh, Clark just about drowned uh, in Great Falls, and Sacagawea <laughs> rescued him while the rest ran for cover or ran for the shore. So they really didn't like water, neither one. And Lewis uh, didn't know how to swim, them, I guess. <laughs> he had two of the others. So one of the last, uh, gr the last group to raft across the river uh, at the confluence there was uh, Lewis, and he uh, 
went into the river here, and on his map, it shows that he came out down here. <laughs> so, so he did record the uh, mishap. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, this is uh, one of the early sketches of Hellgate Canyon, and it probably looked a little bit like this. I think Stanley is the one that uh, drew that one. And then as you come into East Missoula, uh, the highway or the, the road to the Buffalo uh, was really, they think, on Speedway uh, because the... Uh, Speedway would come around in here and down, and you don't see Brickyard Hill there. <laughs> they haven't made the highway. And then it, uh, it, the road comes down through here and goes up into Lurch, uh, Lurch's property. And then, uh, then it comes back up along this ridge right here. There, the cliffs was uh, really... The river was right next to the cliff, so it wasn't something that they could cross easily. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Then, so, so this is the, the route. There's the lurch, uh, the turn off for lurch. The lurch is places right there. And then the trail followed right along the top and went up. Uh, this is Charney's place, if you or anything, and their turn uh, the turnoff for Chorney's is right here, but the trail crosses right in this area right here, about a couple hundred yards from, uh, uh, from the uh, Chorney's. And then uh, it uh, follows the creek down and actually goes through probably Kim's uh, playground or his house. <laughs> uh, he grew up there. And then it goes on out down here. And, and then they came down. I learned a lot about my speech today listening to, uh, to all of you because there are some new changes. or I have new ideas. Uh, but this, let's see. If I get the, you might recognize that place right there because that's the uh, grill <laughs> that we have. And so... Uh, the grill was formed or constructed quite early. There isn't much of West Riverside in that area. Then uh, one of the things, well, the, the trail followed uh, from uh, Marshall Grade down through uh, West Riverside and came up through here. And I really had problems trying to figure out how he went along here. Let's see, I think I can show you in the next slide. Because this is one of the early sketches we have of the, uh, of the canyon. And when you look right here, how are you going to get a trail through there? <laughs> and so I think going up over the ridge is probably a pretty good idea. Uh, then, since we're out here at uh, the brewery, I thought I'd throw in a couple of photographs. <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Gary Matson uh, gave me a couple of plane trips, and I took. Uh, we got a picture of the uh, brewery here, and the next, oops, the next one is uh, pretty close here. Anyway, side view. Uh, then, as they proceeded up the canyon, uh, they went past Blue Falls, or Blue, yeah, Blue Falls, and then uh, this for a while was considered maybe the place that they stayed overnight, but it might be across the road. Uh, so there is some debate as to where they spent the night, but uh, uh, they, they did spend the night there, the third, and then the next day, uh, they started up following the trail. And like they said earlier, the trail was so well used that you couldn't miss it. <laughs> uh, and the Indians said, don't. When they left uh, Lewis there uh, near, Gold, or near Grant Creek, uh, they said, you, you'll, you'll follow the trail because it's easy. And so uh, what they did here is uh, the trail... Uh, at the turnoff, followed this ridge up through the top, and right now at uh, 
uh, Anaconda Company has worked it over so bad that the trail, you just can't follow it. But you get up to the top, uh, here, and where the, uh, whoop, uh, where the power line crosses uh, the ridge right there, uh, the trail came up through here, and then uh, from, from there, uh, it follows along through, and this hasn't been logged over very, good, uh, very much. And so what they found uh, in Ron Cox, if some of you may know him from uh, Sealy Lake, uh, has looked at this area right here in this tree, and that is the tree that uh, he figures uh, started growing in the trail when they uh, started using the road near the river. And so he, he bore sampled it, and when he, when he compares the age that he bore sampled and the time that they uh, built the road and the railroad through there, it correlates very closely. So, uh, so that's a pretty good, I think, confirmation that the, uh, uh, that was the trail. Then if we get up here, this is, uh, this is the uh, Clearwater Junction right here. And then Lewis came up through that area. And then uh, this is, as you go into the canyon uh, after you leave uh, Clearwater Junction, which is a couple miles. And <coughs> what uh, is interesting here is that they probably crossed right there or it possibly could be right in here. But you'll notice how little water that's through there or in here. And so this is probably why Lewis is ready to cross. Yes? Is they on the north side of the river? They followed the north side, yes, all the way. Because they, they really didn't like crossing, uh, getting into the water. Yes. And uh, that was... Uh, yeah, pretty much my uh, section. I, I did th throw in a little bit on uh, Alice Creek because I do have the one uh, last slide here which uh, Dan showed, and you can see the cross right in here. So, okay, I just think a very short brief. I think some of those photos, especially the last ones, were taken during the bicentennial, bicentennial yeah. when the reenactors, the court, what are they called? The oh, this one here was on a special field trip that I was involved with. Better talk to you. That was a field trip that uh, I helped conduct earlier. Is that cross that is in the picture there protected in some way to prevent vandalism? No, it isn't protected. Uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, being covered up by erosion or deposition. All of the uh, sediments are coming down off the hill and covering up the rocks, but uh, it's not protected or it wasn't. Yes. Norm, how many times did they cross the river? You're suggesting right there past Clearwater, they crossed the river? They uh, actually, uh, they crossed first just past uh, Clearwater Junction, and then they went up probably maybe a half a mile and crossed back over so that they could go up uh, toward Seaman Creek. Yes. Okay, I guess that's it. No. I have one, oh. one totally non sequitur. Could you uh, go back a couple of slides here to the Sperry grade right there? This has nothing to do with Lewis and Clark, but I'm also a River Runs Through It fan, which maybe everybody is. <laughs> We've, we have tracked with, with John McLean and, and um, some others where the fishing holes were um, in what is truly a novella, so it's maybe not true, but um, there was one fishing scene 
memorable fishing scene where old Rawhide and Neil were um, found on the beach, drunk, with no clothes on, etc. It was badly sunburned. And the speculation is that it was probably at the campground on Sperry Gray. There's a, there's a sandbar, gravel bar, there that um, seems to match up with the descriptions in this work of fiction. So that was the second of three uh, scenes in the uh, river runs through it, the fishing scenes on the black. So they crossed the river and went on the south side of the river at this point? No, they, they crossed, well, right, right here in this area right here, they did go on the south side. Yeah, but that's where they got on the south side, and they followed the south side? Then, no, they just went up, actually they went up around the corner okay. and crossed back over. Okay. They didn't want to go with very great. Then. No. They crossed back over and then they followed up through the the valley of the humps or the the mounds. Yeah. yeah. We uh, moved moved to uh, Rainbow Bend uh, 31 years ago, and we always wondered because we've got the book Missoula the way it was, and it had some excerpts from the Lewis and Clark journals in there, and it said eight miles. They went eight miles um, from the confluence, and uh, Rainbow Bend is eight and a half miles. And uh, but they said in there that they spent their most delightful evening because you remember that when they camped out on Mullen Road, the mosquitoes were so bad they had to build the smudge fires for smoke. And they said they got up there. And they found this place by the river, and it had a nice area for the horses to graze. And we started checking with some of the people dealing with the records and everything else. And they said that eight miles is kind of a plus or minus thing. But uh, Hidden Valley is right across from the K. Ross Tool Fishing Access Site now. And I can't think of a prettier place for them to camp. And they said they had the most delightful night camping there because there were no mosquitoes. <laughs> and our experience living a half mile from there for 30 some years is we count the mosquitoes on one hand that we see in the summer, which is pretty neat. What, can you tell us a little bit about how, how long a hike is it into the Alice Creek? I'm interested in going there. I don't, it's probably uh, a, a person could do it easily within an hour. It's, it's a little over half a mile, I think. It's not a very, and actually, when, you, when I went in there the first time, I could see why the Indian chose that route, or that route rather than uh, the uh, Way the highway went, <laughs> because it's well yeah, you, it's easily followed. Yes, and there is a turnaround to park your car too. I think it's probably a seven-mile, roughly drive from Highway 200 up the Alice Creek, the west side of Alice Creek, and since the bicentennial, they developed that the trailhead up there, so there's vault toilets. Um, is it for service? That's, yeah. So it's, it's well marked, and uh, there's actually interpretive signs, at least one or two, along the road up to the trailhead where, the, where they, the trail came over the top from Lander's Fork, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's a really... Lewis and Clark Pass is... So Highway 200 goes over Rogers Pass. You probably a mile or two north of that is Kadot Pass or Kadot Pass. And then another maybe, I, I don't know, three miles, three or four miles along the Continental Divide Trail is Lewis and Clark Pass. Both of them, both Kadot and Lewis and Clark, are wide open um, passes that they are gray hiking. They're, um, so. Yep.
We have reached our four o'clock limit. I think we turn into pumpkins or go home. <laughs> but man, what a turnout. I counted 90 people and uh, we just really thank Kettle House for opening this place up for us and hopefully we'll